Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. My name is Evan Shaw. I'm the guy with hot questions and even hotter wings. We have our offering tables in the back of the sanctuary. Please feel free to drop off your offerings as you enter or exit worship today. We also have our Mug Money mission in the back, and this quarter's mission is to help out with Living Bridges in Valdosta, Georgia. Please see Darcy Gunter in the back for more information. We also have our chili cook-off coming up. Do you have the best recipe? Only time will tell. And feel free to sign up for our trunk or treat. Both of those sign-up sheets can be found on our website, and both events will be taking place Sunday, October 29th. Today's guest is best known for losing a fight to a bear mascot, and for going to the gym for the sole purpose of being a low-budget superhero. Please welcome John Cornwell. Hi, how's it going? I'm good, man. So John, how are you around spicy foods? I'd say I'm pretty good, actually. You know, I've done the Blazing Wing Challenge at Buffalo Wild Wings. Crushed it, of course, you know. We'll see. First question. You started at the beginning of your year working on a film called Holiday Road with big time celebrities like Mark Wahlberg. What was that experience like for people so low on the totem pole, such as yourself? Well, you know, I've been doing this for a long time now. I wouldn't exactly say I'm on the bottom of the totem pole. In fact, I'd say those people were thankful they got to work with me. I don't think that's what you're saying. So the first set that you were ever on were was um, a tiny little indie show called Stranger Things. Mm -hmm. I remember that, yeah. <sighs> what was that like, meeting the cast and crew of that show? You know, as I've always said, I always like to give back, of course, and, you know, just for them to be able to meet me and, you know, I let Millie Bobby Brown, you know, shake my hand. I, I talked to her, I gave her a little bit of my time. It was, it was a fun time for my very first experience. That's crazy, because they said the exact opposite about you. Roll the clip. Wait, we don't have a clip? So for the last one, we like to put a little extra on there. We call it the last dab. <laughs> you sure you're up for it? Yeah. All right. <laughs> so before, before we do the last dab, this camera, that camera, and that camera, tell the people at home what we have going on at worship. October 5th to 8th will be our men's walk to Emmaus. October 12th, our food pantry will be open from 1 to 3 p.m. October 12th through the 15th will be our women's walk to Emmaus. October 22nd will be a children's Sunday. And October 28th, the youth will be at Elevate. Is that right. it? That's it. You ready? Uh, no. Cheers. Uh, cheers. <laughs> Let's prepare our hearts for worship. i 
Welcome to the building at 1400. I'm looking for the church. Uh, it's all right. It's all right. Uh, we do welcome you, those of you that are here, those that are joining online, or those that will watch later on online. Uh, no matter where you're at, we hope that you'll make yourself at home. Here I have a thing I'm supposed to tell you who I am. I'm Mike Mobley. I'm the pastor here of the Church of Grady County. And um, I'm supposed to tell you what I do. Well, I've heard everything that you say. I sit around. All week, I work about 18 minutes. I read only the same book. I nap and eat bonbons, all right? So that's what I, what I do. Uh, uh, hopefully, I do a little bit more than that. Um, uh, tons of stuff going on in the church, and obviously, between the wings, you heard a lot of those things. You have a handout. We've got the Facebook page. If you're not in that page, that's where we, uh, that's where we uh, share what's going on, but also a little bit deeper. We share prayer concerns and things like that, stuff that we wouldn't put on a billboard um, out, on, out, on the, uh, out on 84 or whatever. So if you're not in that group and you would like to be in that group, please let me know, and uh, it's a great way to stay up with things. Also, the website has tons of information. Uh, let me see. Um, today, um, today, a portion of our uh, pastoral staff, Paul Blau, will, will be delivering the message today. It'll be completing the series that we're currently in. And then next 
Sunday, we'll start a new series. Uh, I'll kick that one off. It's called Unlikely Disciple. And I look around and I see a whole bunch of people that might be <laughs> look like an unlikely disciple, but a disciple nonetheless. And um, I'm, I'm appreciative for Paul coming in and doing this, this message today. It's going to touch on and surround the concept of stewardship. And, and yes, that sometimes does include money, which leads me into a good little story. Uh, I've really missed Kayla while she's out on family leave, but there was a time she, her office is right across the hall from mine upstairs, and she's in there, and we go back and forth, and she had just seen me, and the phone rang, and so I said, hey, Kayla, can you grab that? And she grabbed, she grabbed the telephone, and the person on the other end says, uh, I need to speak to the head hog at the trough. <laughs> and she says, excuse me? Yeah, yeah head hog at the trough and she says no no no. if you're talking about the guy across the hall you must say that's reverend mobley he says no no no. i need to speak to the head hog at the trough he says well you can call him reverend mike you can call him reverend mobley you can call him pastor but you will not call him head hog at the trough he says well that's funny i just came into a bunch of money and I was going to give $50,000 to the Children and Youth Division. And she said, wait, I think I just heard Porky walk in. <laughs> see, see, all right. uh, let me see. Um, uh, the, the announcements were great. Well, I do want to highlight Children's Sunday, October the 22nd, Children's Sunday. Oh, my. You do not want to, you do not want to miss it. Now, so that you don't want to miss it. Uh, they're going to start working with the children on when, this Wednesday, Leslie, you're here. This Wednesday? Yeah, so after supper, uh, after dinner, this Wednesday, start going to start working with them. Uh, they'll actually practice with the band, did you know this? On the 18th, uh, on Wednesday night, the 18th. So um, anyway, you don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss it. Also, um, uh, we're four, four weeks away from Fall Family Fund at 1400. Be right here. And uh, uh, there's going to be a lot going on. One portion of that is trunk or treat. And so we're asking for the trunks to have some sort of biblical theme. And if you have any questions, uh, I'm sure that Leslie can, um, uh, can help you out. Uh, prayer concerns. A lot of you have shared some things. Uh, we're thankful uh, uh, for those of you that don't know, Paul had his gizzard removed uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, he was supposed to uh, preach last week. We pushed it back to, to this week. But he'll actually be here. So uh, if he comes up here gingerly, uh, prayers do work. And we're thankful for that. Uh, how many of you are like me and you got maybe some unspoken stuff? He hears those as well. Let's take it all to him this morning. Lord, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, this uh, beautiful day that we can come and, and we can just love on you. We can just uh, worship you. We can lift your holy name and, and tell you how awesome you are. Father, we're sorry for <laughs> during this week where we got distracted and we forgot to tell you. Or sometimes, to be quite honest, we, we forgot just how awesome you are because we were looking at whatever was going on in our life. What a beautiful day for us to be able to come together as a church family, as brothers and sisters in Christ, and truly worship you. As we come, uh, every single one of us understands that we've been called to ministry in one way or another. And we, we come here and we're, we're able to partner with one another. And the only way that that works is that we're partnered with you. So during this time, Father, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit on us, gather here, so that we might understand just how empowered we are, just and, and open our eyes to be able to see the things that are going on, the things that you're doing that we can get involved in, the things that uh, maybe our, our, our friends are, are involved in. Maybe we haven't found our thing yet, but guide us and, and let us walk with somebody else and hold their hand and, and help them along the way until we do find out what our thing is. Ultimately, uh, we, we do ask that you, you remind us that everything that we have comes from you. And let us not be sitting back uh, in a stingy manner, holding it, mine, mine, mine. But rather, let us walk out of here being thankful that it's all yours. Let it give us grateful hearts, uh, not only now, but tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Until ultimately we come and sit at that heavenly banquet with all of these people and all of those that are yet to come and, and, and worship you. 
and live life out with you every single day. We pray these things in the blessed, holy name of Jesus. Amen. I don't want to be afraid every time I face the waves. I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to be afraid. I don't want to fear the storm just because I hear it roar. I don't want to fear the storm. I don't want to fear the storm. I'm not going to be afraid just because our only ways. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to fear the storm. You are greater than it's war.
peace, bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it break. At your name, still call the sea to still, the rage in me to still. Every way at your name, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, you silence me, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. these bones to live, call these lungs to sing once again, I will praise thee, call these bones to live, call these lungs to sing.
But then I hear a voice as it opened up the heavens, reminding me of who I've always been. And I am your beloved, you have bought me with your blood, and on your hand you The one the Father loves, mercy has defeated all my shame. There's no accusation or any condemnation when I look into my Father's eyes. They don't see my sin, they only see redemption. This is how my heart has been defined. And then I hear a voice that is louder than the thunder, reminding me of who I've always been. You have bought me with your blood, and on your hand you've written out my name. And I am your beloved, the one the Father loves. Mercy has defeated all my shame.
This is going to be my first message since Pastor Mike asked me to be the associate pastor. This is going to be my fourth time serving in the role of associate pastor at a church. I have over 40 years of experience in ministry, and so I've done a lot of different things. I've worked with kids, and I've worked with youth. I've served three times as a senior pastor. Out of all of the things, though, that I've ever been involved in, my passion's always been discipleship. I love to see people get it. It's that aha moment when it just kind of clicks and they understand the truth that maybe they've been struggling with. I like building discipleship programs. When Pastor Mike asked me about being the associate pastor, adult discipleship in particular was the area that he wanted me to first focus on. Hopefully you've seen some of the things that we've been at work doing. Some changes in the Wednesday night format and some additions in the Sunday morning format as well. Keep tuned. We've got a lot more that we're working on as time permits. This is going to be the fourth and the final message in our Plan and Prepare series. So far, Pastor Mike has taken us through all of the importance of having a plan and how to be prepared. But now we're going to look at performing. How do we enact the plan? In other words, how do we put the plan in motion? See if you can help me finish this statement. We don't have members here. We have, wow, I heard a lot of young voices get that really quickly. The distinction must be significant between being just a member and being a partner in ministry because we say this every week, don't we? Have you ever stopped to think what it means, though? From the very start, the church is making it clear that we're not looking for spectators, but rather co-ministers, working cooperatively with each other to advocate the work of Jesus. In essence, we are partnering with God by partnering in ministry. You know, Jesus was passionate about a lot of different types of ministry, whether it was finding sick people that were in need of healing or poor people who needed a help up or maybe just a good meal. Maybe it was orphans or widows. All of these disenfranchised people groups, Jesus was passionate about serving them. The list goes on and on. You know, our church is pretty similar, isn't it? Here's a, a quick list of ministries that we are involved with outside of our regular work here at the church. You know, the regular function of the church is evangelism, leading people to Jesus, education, discipling them after they've come to know Jesus, and encouraging them, building them up, and helping them to grow as people. Now, this is not meant to be an exhaustive list, and so if we don't mention your particular passion point, please don't think we're trying to slight it or ignore it. Uh, Pastor Mike and I sat in his office and came up real quickly with a list of 20 different things that the church is involved in outside of just the regular work of the, the church that I just mentioned. Again, not meant to be an exhausted list, but just something to kind of show you how engaged and involved we are. We're involved in these, some of these programs. Living Bridges. Counseling. Let me stop for just a second in there. Pastor Mike does a lot of counseling, above and beyond what normal pastors do. Every pastor does some counseling, but Pastor Mike really goes outside of the, the, the norm there and, and reaches out. In fact, this is past week, I called on him to help one of my employees who was having a, a, a crisis, and he stepped right up and was able not only to meet with him that day, but also to help him find a program that was fit for him and was something that was going to be able to help him, and we really appreciate that. We're involved in the food pantry, first option care, Lawson Neal Med Bank that helps provide low cost or free medicine to those that can't afford it, the Grady County Foster Parent Association, the Thomas Grady Service Center, also known as the ARC, which Pastor Mike and myself both serve on the board at, the Help Agency, Salvation Army, Easter Seals, Project Cirque. Camp Crosspoint, and then now a couple of ministries that are super important to Pastor Mike in particular, 
and is important to the church because I think uh, based on what I've heard, about 60% of our congregation has participated in one or, or, or uh, of these programs. And this is the Walk to Emmaus, which is coming up in just next week and a couple weeks after. Chrysalis, which is the youth version of Walk to Emmaus. Face to Face, a brand new one that is for seniors. We're involved in the Handmaiden House. And we're involved in missions. Cody and Katie Fox, you've gone to mission field. And then Shane Lovren up in North Georgia, serving in different areas. The Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and then Family Connection. That's 20. I am sure that there's more, but I think you get the idea. The church is involved in our community in a big way, just like Jesus was. Jesus saw a need. He stepped into that need. Our church sees a need. We step into that need as best we're able to do. Well, Jesus actually tells us a parable about doing ministry that gives us a lot of insight into what he expects from all of us. It's one that you're probably very familiar with. We often call it the parable of the Good Samaritan. And there are a lot of truths that we can glean from this parable, but I only want to focus on just one small point today. Let's read it together now. And Jesus replied, and I want to stop for just a second right there, because these are the words of Jesus. This is really cool. You know, I don't know if you really ever stop to think about this, but we get to actually read the words of Jesus. Not what somebody else said he said, but this is like, you know, an eyewitness record of his words, just like him speaking to us. So we could go back in time and we could sit there, we would hear these same words come out of his mouth. The words of God himself. A certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell on the hands of robbers. They both stripped him and beat him, and after inflicting blows on him, they went away, leaving him half dead. Now, by coincidence, a certain priest was going down on the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. And in the same way, also a Levite, so these are religious people. The priest, the Levite, would be like a, like a pastor or a teacher or pastor or a deacon or an elder at a church. These are people that are supposed to be leaders in the religion. In the same way, also, the Levite, when he came down to the place, he saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, and a Samaritan, you've got to kind of understand the context here, that's not a religious leader. This is a person that's kind of a mixed race. He's like part Jew, part Gentile, really, really despised by Jewish people, really looked down on. So this is an outcast person. This is that same group of people that Jesus is usually the one ministering to. So here's this Samaritan, this outcast individual. He comes along. What does he do? He was traveling and he came up to him and when he saw him, he had compassion. And he came up and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. And he put him on his own animal and he brought him to an inn and he took care of him. And on the next day, he took out two denarii, enough to take care of him for quite a while, and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and whatever you spend in addition, I will repay you when I return. Which of these do you suppose became a neighbor to the man who fell amongst the robbers? So he said, the one who showed mercy to him. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. You know, we're commanded by Jesus to show mercy to our neighbors. He illustrates not just who our neighbor is in this parable, the story that Jesus tells to kind of help understand a principle that's a little harder to understand without the story. But he also tells us how we are to demonstrate mercy. By identifying three distinct acts that the Samaritan does for the injured man. You see, God's resources are his people, and specifically their talents, their time, and their treasure. First, the Samaritan stops to see about him, investing his time. Next, he personally ministers to the wounds, investing his talent. Last, he pays the innkeeper to further care, thus investing his treasure. 
Each of these represents an item of scarcity or limitation to the Samaritan. He had to give up something in each case to help this injured man. He either gave up his time or his talent or his treasure so that that man might have an opportunity to get better. And because he gave it to this man, it means that he had less of each of these things, time, less talent, less treasure that he could spend on either other people, other things, or himself. When considering our our personal ministries for Jesus, we can use the same guide. How are we investing our time, our talent, and our treasure to further his kingdom? You know, time is scarce. We only have so much time in this world. Our life is defined by a dash on a gravestone. You got a birth date, you got a death date, and a little dash in between. And that's the sum total. The Bible describes it as but a vapor, just a short little window of time. It's all we get. We all come with an expiration date, and we don't even know when it is. Every day that passes is one day closer to our last day, and one day further from our birthday. How great is the tragedy of the soul who waits too long, putting off the most important things to a future date that never actually come. Over and over again, Jesus will say, today is the day. Now is the time. This is the day that we have. Today is the day that we must serve the Lord and honor him. Now, whether that's by volunteering to help in one of our existing ministries, evangelism, education, encouragement, or maybe one of those 20 that I mentioned, or maybe it's starting a brand new one, we need your help. The more partners that we have doing ministry, the more impact we can make. We need your time. Talent is also scarce. God uses people to do work on this earth. I know he's big and he's God and we have this impression he can just do anything. And he can. But he chooses to do it through people. Through our talent. In Genesis, it shows us that we were created to do the work of caring for the earth. And in the great commission of Jesus, the last thing, you know, kind of his instruction as he's leaving this world, he gives us this commission. He tells us to go. That's a really active word, go. Not everyone can do everything, but everybody can do something. You're not supposed to do everything. God doesn't expect you or call you to do what you're not able to do. You hear Pastor Mike worry about getting called to Uganda. He's worried about being sent to Africa. God would never send somebody to something that they're not able to do or that he's not going to enable them to do it. Don't let your excuse for not serving God being afraid that maybe he will ask you to do something that you're not comfortable with. That's just not his nature. God doesn't expect you or call you to do what you're not able to do. In fact, God doesn't call you to do anything that he hasn't already evidenced by enabling you. However, if you don't do this thing that God has called you to do, that he has enabled you to do, I want you to understand that it's just going to go undone because God works through people. You have limited resources of talent and energy. If you use them all in one place, you can't use them elsewhere. Ask yourself, why did God bless you with the talents that you have if it wasn't to serve him and to help others? God needs his teachers to teach, his preachers to preach, his singers to sing. Whatever talent he gave you, he needs you to use it. Find your thing and do it. The Bible tells us 
Therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all things for the glory of God. Now, God doesn't need everybody to be a preacher or a missionary to Uganda or a teacher or even a singer. There's so many more ways that you can serve God. What do you enjoy doing? What are you good at? Give that to Jesus. You may think that it's not flashy enough, it's not exciting enough, but God loves all of the things that you love. There's so many ways that you can serve him. Do it for him and do it with him. To some talented fishermen, Jesus invited them to just become fishers of men. What talent can you bring to Jesus? So when I was little, <laughs> we only used to get four channels on the television. Can you imagine? Four channels. And they were programmed ahead of time, and you couldn't select anything. You couldn't skip over something. You couldn't watch it when you wanted to. You watched it when it was on. There was no video recorders, no DVDs, no instant access, no streaming. If it wasn't on one of those channels, you didn't watch it. You know, holidays were magical on television. They came with holiday specials. And Christmas was the best of all of them. There was a whole suite of special shows that came on only at Christmas time. Some of my very biggest favorites. Shows like Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer, A Charlie Brown Christmas, Frosty the Snowman. Oh, they were anticipated by me all year long. And I made sure by looking in a thing called a TV guide to know exactly when those were going to be on. And so I wouldn't miss a one of them. One of my very favorites was known as the Little Drummer Boy. Each year, I was enthralled by the story of this poor little orphan boy who only had his little drum and his friend, the little lamb. Each year, I would cry when the lamb was killed, was ran over by a chariot and died. I can still remember the very first time I watched that. My parents threatened to turn the TV off because I was crying so hard. I thought it was too, too emotional for me. But each year I would rejoice when the baby Jesus touched the little lamb and he sprang back to life. And I knew the story. I'd watched it before. But every year I'd repeat this. Every year I would cry when the lamb died and every year I would get so excited when he came back to life. And the little drummer boy had nothing, nothing material anyways, that he could give to the baby king that he so appreciated for restoring the life of the lamb. So he gave his talent, and he played his little drum for Jesus. And Jesus honored that gift because it was sincere and it was from the heart. It's a wonderful story. Talent is scarce, but it belongs to the Lord. Treasure is also scarce. You only have so much money, so much possessions. If you spend all of your money <coughs> in this life, on this life, you'll be neglecting investing in your next and eternal life. The Bible encourages us not to lay up treasure here in the earth where moth and rust can corrupt it, but rather in heaven. Are you giving God what is right, or are you giving God what is left, as in left over? Do you know how Jesus' ministry was financed? Have you ever thought about that? That Jesus, just like our church, had bills. The disciples needed to eat. They needed a place to stay. They needed materials for the lessons. How was Jesus' ministry financed? Well, 
Luke actually gives us the answer in chapter 8. And it happened in afterwards also that he was going about from one town and village to another, preaching and proclaiming the good news concerning the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases, Mary who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Seems like a lot. And Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others. Now pay attention to this. Who were helping to support them from their possessions. Now think about that for just a second. Do you know it was a bunch of women that financed Jesus' ministry? Isn't that amazing? We might like to imagine that Jesus performed all of these miracle after miracle to pull money out of thin air. But the truth is, is that God used the generosity of a group of women to enable Jesus and the disciples to do their ministry. God used people to finance his ministry then, and he still does today. The church's job isn't to raise funds, but money is necessary to enable ministry to be done. Salaries still need to be paid. Materials still need to be purchased, and bills still have to be taken care of. More importantly, though, the greater our financial resources, the greater our opportunity to help hurting people. You remember that list of 20 different things that we were involved in? We'd be involved in 20 more if we had the funds. The greater our resources, the greater our opportunity to hurt or to help hurting people and thereby earn the right to share with them the gospel. Oh, I love to be asked by somebody that we've helped, why are you doing this? Why are you helping me? I get to smile and reply, <laughs> because of Jesus. Can I tell you about him? How can you give to support the work of the church? Hopefully behind me, nope, that's a little drummer boy still, but there'll be a URL code, and then at the front up there, there is as well. We can give through the little basket, but you can also give online very easily. I want to close by asking this final question. So why don't we invest our time, our talent, and our treasure then? We see the need, and Jesus showed us the way, yet the work, it's just not getting done. I think there are some very basic reasons why, and maybe if we say them out loud, they'll lose some of their grip on us. It's not my responsibility or my job. Hmm. Got to be somebody's though. I'm too busy. I have somewhere else to go or something else to do. But somebody's got to do it. I'm still upset about something that I saw that bothered me, so I'm, I'm not participating anymore. Well, I hope everybody doesn't get angry. I thought somebody else would do it. So did they. I don't feel good or I'm depressed. Hey, guys, I had surgery two weeks ago. I get it. But you still got to get up and do the work. I'm afraid I'll get caught up in a problem or caught up in something that I don't want to get involved in. Get messy. Get involved. I just can't afford to. You can't afford not to. I'm sure there are dozens more excuses, but that's all they are. They're just excuses. They're not reasons. Jesus says it like this. Do you not say that there are yet four months until the harvest comes? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields. They are white for harvest already. There's so much that needs to be done, but the church suffers from a severe lack of time, volunteer time, talent, volunteer resources, and treasure your financial gifts. And that's not something we can remedy without your help. We need you to volunteer to work with the children and the youth. Look around. Just see how blessed we are to have such a young congregation with so many children and youth. Do you know that 80% of everyone that ever accepts Christ does so before they're 18 years old? We are in a significant opportunity 
that God has presented to us can make a difference for eternity in their lives. We need you to bring your kids to church. We need you to help us with the 20 plus other ministries that we're actively involved in. We need you to help us with evangelism by inviting your neighbors, your near ones, to come to church with you. We appreciate all of you visiting with us this morning. We need you to help with education by attending our adult discipleship program, something that I'm near and dear passionate about and that we're working on. We have programs at 9.15 every Sunday morning and at 6.30 every Wednesday. And yes, we need your help with finances. The more that we can collect, the more we can do. Just like Mary Magdalene and the others empowered Jesus through their generosity, we need you to empower the church through yours. If we all did our part, imagine what we could accomplish for Jesus. Won't you join us this morning and be true partners in ministry? I want to invite you to stand at this time. If God is at work in your heart, on any of the things that I shared or maybe something he spoke to you privately about, the altar is open for you. If you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we want you to come to know him today. If you'd like to join our church, again, we don't have members. We have, that's what I've been talking about today. If you'd like to be a partner in ministry, why don't you come up, see Miss Karen, and she'll be glad to talk with you about that. Whatever your need may be, the altar is open for you. Maybe you just want to get more involved. We really need you to. There's a lot to do and a little to do it with. I've heard the accusations and I've heard the propaganda and heard the lies they whisper to my soul. I have been forsaken and I'll always be forgotten no matter what I do it's not enough but then I hear a voice as it opened up the heaven reminding me of who I've always been and I am your Beloved, you have bought me with your blood, and on your hand you written out my name. I am your beloved, the one the Father loves. Mercy has defeated all my shame. There's no accusation or any condemnation when I look into the Father's eyes. They don't see my sin, they only see redemption. This is how my heart has been defined. Then I hear a voice that is louder than the thunder, reminding me of who I've always been. I am your beloved, you have bought me with your blood, and on your hand you The one the Father loves, mercy has defeated all my shame. And 
there's nothing I have done that could change the Father. Oh, the one who knows me best is the Now it's time to go and be the church. Amen.